Good afternoon, and welcome to this week's program of the American Presidency, our six-week series of conversations with historians, scholars, and journalists about the most important elected office in the world. Our program is brought to you by the Lyndon B. Johnson Presidential Library, the University of Texas Osher Lifelong Mis Learning Institute, and Humanities Texas. I'm Phil Barnes, and it is my privilege to chair the UT Olive Sage Enrichment Committee. As we said often in this series, in this year, 2024, we will hold our 60th presidential election since the first in 1788. And in this series, we look back at six pivotal elections elections that were of great consequence in American history. Those of 1960, 1860, 1896, 1948, 64, 68, and 1980, from Lincoln to Reagan. Mark Lawrence, my good friend and the director of the LBJ Presidential Library, and himself a widely respected historian, is the host of our conversations. As a member of the audience, you may participate in the Q&A segment of our program by using the chat function to write and submit questions. And I encourage you to do so. Our Q&A host today is Mark's colleague and our friend, Sarah McCracken of the LBJ Library. Today is special because we welcome our guest historian, Nancy Beck Young, professor of history at the University of Houston, and she is one of our own. Dr. Young received her BA from Baylor University and her MA and PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. She has been recognized and has had residential fellowships at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C., and served as a Columbus Fellow in the Southwest Studies at Southern Methodist University. And she is a prolific author of numerous publications. And her most recent book of interest to us today is Two Sons of the Southwest. The presidential election of 1964 may be seen as a generational shift, a defining moment in recent American history. The 64 election was a contest between two men of the Southwest, each with a very different idea of what America should be. The Republican Senator from Arizona, Barry Goldwater, has been said to represent a nostalgic, idealized past, the preservation of traditional order. While the incumbent Democratic president, Lyndon B. Johnson, wanted an expansive liberal future of increased opportunity for everyone. So it was a showdown, as it's been characterized, I think quite correctly, between liberalism and conservatism, an election about individual rights versus legislative equality as priorities of the federal government. One whose outcome would echo throughout the rest of this century, and indeed, into the next. So to discuss the pivotal election of 1964, welcome for today's interview, Nancy Beck Young, author of Two Sons of the Southwest, Lyndon Johnson, Barry Goldwater, and the Battle Between Liberalism and Conservatism. And now, to Mark Lawrence. Well, thank you so much, Phil. I really appreciate that kind introduction and welcome everyone. It's wonderful to have you back for this fourth installment of our 2024 version of the American presidency. And welcome most especially to Nancy Beck Young. It's wonderful to have you. Um, thank you, Nancy Mark. Thank you, Mark. And thank you to everyone at the LBJ Library for making this uh, very important series available to 
the over 300 listeners out there, if I can read the participant tick. <laughs> It's an it's an impressive turnout, and we're so grateful to everyone who's here with us today. Nancy, it's great to have you uh, on any number of subjects that you are where you are truly an expert, but especially to talk about the election of 1964, which it seems to me is a really fascinating, even unique moment in American political history. At, at one level, it was a landslide, and so you might not think, well, this how could this be pivotal if it you know if it turned into such a gigantic landslide? But I think we can see now, you know, with the benefit of hindsight that the 1964 election, as Phil just mentioned, was one of those moments that kind of crystallized different political currents. And we can see that the issues that were in play in 1964 would continue to ripple through American politics in the decades thereafter, and indeed uh, down to the to the present. Um, Nancy, let me let me just start with the the title. Of, of your book, Two Sons of the Southwest. You you put the Southwestern origins of Barry Goldwater and Lyndon Johnson right there up front. Why did you make that choice and what are you trying to convey with that title? That's a that's an excellent question, Mark. So what I want readers to get uh is that there were different versions of the Sunbelt, if you will, uh encapsulated in Lyndon Johnson and in Barry Goldwater. And maybe I'll explain what I mean starting out in a non-serious manner, and then I'll get more serious. One journalist during the campaign decided that wouldn't it be interesting to publish side by side Lyndon, Gold, Lyndon Johnson's recipe for chili and Barry Goldwater's recipe for chili. I've had Lyndon Johnson's chili served at the Texas White House. That's another story. Uh, I have not, I've read Barry Goldwater's chili recipe. I've not had it. And with no disrespect to Barry Goldwater or his family or his partisans, I think I will take a pass on Goldwater's chili. It called for canned mushrooms. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Two men from the Southwest, but two men with very different ideas of what the Southwest meant, if their dueling chili recipes tell us anything. Uh, so let me get a little bit more serious with that. We're at a moment by 1964 in American history where the Southwest is becoming more politically important in the United States. In part, that is the result of two, three plus decades of federal spending in the region going at least as far back as the New Deal with federal government uh, projects that made the uninhabitable habitable uh, through uh, the building of dams and reservoirs and the like, but also during uh, the World War II years with the location of untold uh, millions, billions of dollars in defense plants throughout the Southwest. So these things made the Southwestern region habitable and desirable and that is happening at the same time that the Rust Belt is becoming less of an economic driver in the United States. And people who had been employed in factories in the Midwest are moving Southwest for better economic opportunities. So these macro developments are coming to a head during uh, during the 1960s, and you see them uh, working out in these different visions of the Sun Belt and different visions of the United States uh, writ large uh, during uh, during this time period. So I, I, yeah. that's why I decided to play with the concept of the S-U-N and the S-O-N mm -hmm. and uh, Johnson versus oh. Goldwater in the campaign for the White House. It's also worth noting that this is the first time two candidates from the Sun Belt, the South, the West went head to head against each other for the presidency. 
And until 2012, there was at least one Southerner or Southwesterner or Westerner on the uh, general election ballot, 2012 being the first time that did not happen when Barack Obama mm -hmm. stood for re-election against Mitt Romney. So, yeah. and we've not had a Southerner or Southwestern person on the ballot since 2012 either, with 2016 being uh, Secretary Clinton versus Donald yeah. Trump. And 2020, and yes, right, right. <laughs> um, it, sticking with your your title for just a moment, you 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 identified 1964 as the the battle between liberalism and conservatism. Conservatism, of course, I want to get there in a minute and unpack sure. the ver the variations right that ran within the Republican Party and the struggle really to de determine what the Republican st Party stood for. But let's start with that all important word whenever we're talking about the 1960s liberalism. What what do you mean by that? And um uh, help us understand that term so that we can have a conversation using that term in confidence that we're all on the same page. Sure, sure. And that's a really important uh, point to make because there's not a static definition of liberalism, nor is there a static definition of conservatism. So let me talk first about the liberalism that Johnson grew up with and what it had morphed into by the 1960s. So Johnson grew up in a hill country that looks nothing like the territory just to the west of where you sit. Uh, people who lived in the hill country when Johnson was a child and a young man were not wealthy. Uh, people who lived in the hill country when Johnson was a child and a young man really had to work hard to keep body and soul together. And so they gravitated in the late 19th and the early 20th century to the ideas of the populists and then in the very early 20th century to the ideas of the progressives. And they were committed New Dealers by the 1930s. And by the 1930s, Johnson is a young man on the move in state and national politics. And he makes Franklin Roosevelt into one of his many political daddies. Johnson worshipped mm. at the altar of the New Deal, which was all about using the resources and the power of the federal government to ameliorate against the poverty of the Great Depression. So think things like Social Security, think things like banking regulation and reform, and think about all of the various work relief programs that were more temporary parts of the New Deal. This was a liberalism that was about economics. And historians have argued a lot about which version of liberalism, the 1930s liberalism that was about economics, or the liberalism that comes into vogue in the 1960s with and because of Johnson that was also rights-based about first bringing civil rights to African Americans, but then expands from the 60s into the 1970s to bring rights to women and to bring rights to Chicanos and Chicanas and to uh, American Indians, as the movement was termed then, and then also to the environment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So on Johnson's presidential watch, liberalism widens to be oh. about rights based uh, requests as much as about economics. There's another piece that is changing in the landscape of American liberalism that I think I have to put on the table. Hmm. Uh, and, and, and so it's not like the economic liberalism necessarily goes away, but it's sharing space with rights-based liberalism. But there is a shift 
if you will, in the economic liberalism from the 30s versus the economic liberalism of uh, the 60s. So economic liberalism in the 30s was maybe more about opportunity, whereas economic liberalism in the 60s was maybe more about entitlement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that distinction between equal opportunity versus entitlement is where lots of conflict and disagreement boiled over. And I'm sure we're going to get into some of that as the conversation continues. But does that work as a real quick comprehensive exams explanation <laughs> of the evolution of liberalism. A plus, I think that's fantastic. Okay. Uh, it gives us a lot to a lot to work with as as we move forward. Before we get into those, those you know, the development of liberalism and conservatism, let's talk about the star of the show, Lyndon Johnson. Um, and of course, I, you know, I want to talk with you about how he positioned himself during the race. But you know him not only as a historian, but also through some firsthand experience with Lyndon Johnson. Describe that and tell us what kind of a person you experienced when you uh, when you encountered LBJ. Sure. Well, so anybody who's listening has probably figured out I am a native of Texas. <laughs> My accent is... <sighs> Obvious. Uh, I grew up in uh, uh, East Texas, about an hour south of Dallas, and my father was the stereotypical yellow dog Democrat. He had grown up in a stereotypically yellow dog Democratic household. Uh, my grandfather had been Democratic county chair for 20 years, and my dad was Democratic county chair for 16 years, starting in, I think, 1960 and uh, finishing out in 76 uh, or thereabouts. Hmm. Uh, my father wrote to, you know, any Democrat who was anybody from the time he became active in politics in the late 40s. So I have his correspondence with Sam Rayburn and I have his correspondence with Jim Wright and I have his correspondence with Lyndon Johnson to whom he started writing in the 50s and wrote more. And politicians then wrote back. Sam Rayburn once said he would much rather have a letter written on a big chief tablet from a real person than a, a mass generated form letter. And I think that that sentiment carried over to Lyndon Johnson as well. And so my father and uh, Senator Johnson had a correspondence that went back and forth that increased during the vice presidency and increased more during the presidency. At some point during the presidency, Johnson wrote to my father, watch the newspapers, and when you see that I'm going to be at the Texas White House, bring your family down for a visit. Mm. So we went for the first time in December of 1968 and went back for about 12 to 15 more trips until the president's death. He put us up in the same trailer house where Lucy and Linda would stay when they came to the ranch to visit their parents. On one trip, he loaned us one of the Lincolns to drive to see the Easter fires pageant in Fredericksburg. And it was just this grand, amazing journey that I took for granted. And the adult version of me realizes just how rare and how special it was for someone who was not important. I mean, my father was very important to me, but he was not an important person. Uh, to have a friendship with a former president of the United States. So, yes, I was, we were served chili. I'm not sure that I actually ate it. I was a bit of a picky eater. My At parents, least there were no mushrooms. There were no mushrooms. Uh, I have since made the president's chili recipe, and I really, the six, seven-year-old version of me didn't know what she was missing out on because it was good. Uh, uh, but yes, lots of trips to the ranch. And on those occasions, I, I saw 
I, I, I saw what made him a political genius. If I can just tell one story that I have in the opening of the book. So Lyndon Johnson was a giver of gifts. And every time we went to the ranch, we left with gifts. And I have at home 18 karat gold jewelry with Lyndon Johnson's head on it. And I have uh, that, you know, I keep very close care of and I have a a pony and a doll not an actual pony uh, a plastic pony and a doll that shows the abuse that a six seven eight year old child can give to a toy and everything in between on one trip the president gave my little brother one of those super bouncy balls and my brother at the time was still in diapers. So small person, really super small person. Johnson was giving us a tour of the ranch in one of the Lincolns. And he drove close to the fence at which tourists could gather. And he noticed that there were some tourists at the fence and there was a small child with the tourists. And Johnson says to my father, John, I want to give that ball to the little boy across the fence. Don't worry, I've got plenty of them back at the house. I'll 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 get your son another one. Uh, and Johnson proceeds to get out of the car and throw the ball to the boy across the fence. I'm sure it's antics like this that drove the Secret Service. <laughs> no doubt. But it was Lyndon Johnson. So oh. what are you going to do? Johnson's arm wasn't quite what he had hoped it would be. And he did not make his throw. And so he directed my father to go get the ball. And my father goes and gets the ball and proceeds to walk it to the fence to give it to the boy. And Johnson yells at my father, no, John, bring it back here. And so my father brings the ball back to the president who really winds it up good and makes the throw. Now, that stuck with me as a child. But the adult historian version of me sees that as Lyndon Johnson's need to be all things to all peoples and the direct font of the beneficence that he had hoped that he had provided to the American people. No intermediaries, no. <laughs> if at that all is, possible. That, I, I completely agree. That's a really illuminating story from just a, a, a moment that I'm sure passed very, very quickly. Um, yeah. um, okay, so... Putting back your historian hat, let's return to the campaign of, of 1964. So as we all know, Lyndon Johnson was propelled into the presidency under tragic circumstances in November 1963. He's keenly aware at that point that he has one year right before the right. election of 1964, and it's clear that he wants to run in his own right for the presidency. Talk, if you would, about what he believed in that all-important year between November and November, how he believed he needed to position himself to win the presidency, which was clearly vital to his own perception of himself as a as a as a man who could appeal to the American people. Well, he starts when he lands on that really sad end of that really sad day at uh, Andrews with his brief remarks just asking for prayers and then follows up briefly, well, follows up in more detail with his address to the joint session of Congress, his let us continue speech. And I've always held that that let us continue speech is his moment of making the presidency his own, but also beginning the process of creating Camelot, mm. uh, which we think of as more of a Jacqueline Kennedy uh, a, a operation. But Johnson, in his own way, plays a role of making Kennedy perhaps more in death than he was in life because a refrain that runs throughout Johnson's legislating in that year that he has between rising to the presidency and the election of do it in the memory of Jack Kennedy, mm -hmm. do it for the dead president. And it can be everything from the tax cut 
to what becomes the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So Johnson claims this very wide middle of the road posture with let us continue in an effort to wrap his arms around the American people and state his ambition to fulfill the Kennedy agenda. So I think that's, yep. I think that's the most important step that he takes. Right. And it seems to me it, it was a complicated balancing act in LBJ's mind between capitalizing on the Kennedy legacy and yet defining himself as his own man, right, who had his own priorities. Um, and that had to be a, a, a tricky uh, balance to strike across that year. Yes. And made all that much trickier by Lyndon Johnson's shall we say, fragile ego and uh, insecurities, uh, which uh, were apparent to anyone who who knew him. Yeah, but I think the most important thing that he is able to accomplish is showing off his legislative prowess. Hmm. Uh, Mark, you and I have talked separately about Johnson as the country's best legislative president, and we've compared him to Biden, uh, who also has more than a few uh, legislative chops from his many, many years in the U.S. Senate. Uh, Johnson's scorecard is maybe longer, but Johnson had a much better Congress mm. with which to deal than Joe Biden has had for his not even four years in the White House yet. So Johnson shows his legislative skills by getting civil rights enacted. He had been Senate Majority Leader when Congress enacted the first civil rights bill since Reconstruction in 1957. The most significant thing about the 1957 Civil Rights Act was that it carried the word act after and a presidential signature that made it law because other than that it didn't do anything in the words of illinois senator paul douglas the 1957 civil rights act was like soup made from the shadow of a crow that had been starved to death there was nothing there and johnson knew that but he also understood the importance of precedent and making something seem possible. So 57 made passing civil rights possible. And 64 was the opportunity to do it with teeth. And so that's what he did. Oh. His ability to work across the aisle was very important to the success of 64 civil rights Johnson regularly had Senate Minority Leader Everett Dirksen to the White House in the evening to trade uh, glasses of scotch and tales of politics. They were from opposite parties, but they shared a love of country and a desire to move some civil rights legislation forward. There's a wonderful, well, you have many phone uh, tapes in your custody, but there's an especially wonderful phone tape from June of 1964 when Johnson is talking to House, House Minority Leader uh, Charlie Halleck about getting a rule on the civil rights bill that had just passed the Senate uh, filibuster that was coming back to the House to reconcile the differences between the two bills. And Johnson wants to sign the bill on July 4th and Halleck doesn't want that. Halleck realizes that the bill is going to give the Democrats a lot of political ammunition for the fall and Halleck wants to minimize that as much as possible. And the back and forth between these two is a masterclass mm -hmm. in political um, manipulation, the so-called Johnson treatment, as 
Halleck just realizes there's no way he's going to win. And uh, Johnson, you know, Johnson's saying, I want to come hug you. I want to love on you. I want to pat you. And Halleck is, you can just hear him sinking (laughs) with inside himself because he's not going to win. And he didn't. Johnson signed 64 civil rights into law. And it was a tremendous boon to his campaign that fall. So on the on the Democratic side, clearly Lyndon Johnson was dominant. Let's turn for a moment and talk about the other side, the Republican side, where the situation was, of course, uh, much more complicated. The the GOP at that time was a very big tent with lots of different political tendencies within it. In fact, you you call it a kind of civil war that was raging within the party um, through the the 1960s. Talk, if you would, a little bit about the the nature of the Republican Party and how it had evolved to the point where Barry Goldwater would become the standard bearer in 1964. Sure. Okay. So I'll move through about 30 years worth of history (laughs) as quickly as I possibly can. So Herbert Hoover elected in 1928 and had the great misfortune of the depression happening on his watch. The Republicans did not have another presidential victory until Dwight Eisenhower in 1952. In 36, in 40, in 44, and 48, the Republicans nominated a series of moderate establishment-oriented Republicans who never took on the New Deal, never challenged the New Deal, and never won. And so that produces schisms within the Republican Party between that moderate East Coast establishment wing and the more conservative party as it existed within Congress. And those tensions become more exaggerated, not less, after Dwight Eisenhower's presidency, because Dwight Eisenhower was another moderate who argued for modern republicanism that did not provide a lot of space or love for those conservatives in Congress. So the conservatives decide, and and the party nominated Richard Nixon, who had moderate bona fides by virtue of being Eisenhower's vice president, even though Nixon is a more complicated figure. Liberals uh, had not forgiven him for his red baiting campaign uh, for the Senate in uh, the 1950s. But still, Nixon was viewed as establishment, not conservative Mm. in his 60 run for the White House. Uh, The conservatives are bound and determined by 64 to name their candidate. Okay, so that gets us to 64. (laughs) Now let's get to Goldwater. Presidential nominations in the 60s did not look anything like presidential nominations in the last, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years even. There were only three competitive primaries on the Republican side. Not every candidate had their name on the ballot in every state. Those three competitive primaries were New Hampshire, won by a write-in candidate, Henry Cabot Lodge, who was serving as ambassador and so not actively politicking, but he still won in New Hampshire as a write-in candidate. So think about that for a minute uh, and the strangeness of that to our modern ears. Nelson Rockefeller, another moderate establishment Republican, wins the Oregon primary. The last remaining competitive primary is California, and it's a two-man race between Rockefeller and Goldwater. Rockefeller's biggest disadvantage in the California race, perhaps, was the ill-timed birth of his child with Happy Rockefeller. Mm -hmm. 
Rockefeller was a fairly recent divorced man who remarried the woman whom perhaps he had become acquainted while still married, shall we say. So a difficult marital history in a moment in time where Americans were expecting monogamy from presidents or at least not investigating presidential behavior in that way, or at least the image of monogamy. Uh, and so the birth of Rockefeller's child at the same time as the primary just draws out into the open Rockefeller's uh, personal, messy personal life uh, it, from a 1960s perspective. It seems pretty normal in 2024. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. But um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is that Goldwater had the advantage of a very hungry and very organized right wing in California. And so much so that unsavory organizations like the John Birch Society were really out there working hard on Goldwater's behalf. And so Goldwater pulls off the win in California, and that is enough to position him to get the nomination when the Republicans meet in their convention later that uh, summer in California at the infamous affair at the Cow Palace, where those very loud Goldwater partisans take over the show. They boo Nelson Rockefeller mm -hmm. off the stage. Even police who were on duty to keep things under control joined in the booing of Rockefeller during uh during his his speaking and then when it's Goldwater's uh turn to speak well his his walk on music was um oh um uh, uh, I'm blanking here for a second glory glory hallelujah mm. uh which ironically given Goldwater's tortured history of race began as a black spiritual mm -hmm. and then became uh became a, a union oriented song during the civil war but then goldwater gives his his speech with the infamous line extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue which caused one journalist to quip, my God, he's going to run as Barry Goldwater. Yeah. <laughs> and he did. Um, so a lot of historians have observed over the years, and I, th I think you do as well in your book, that Goldwater's lack of broad popularity across the American public helped to make the 64 race into the landslide that that it became. To, to what extent do you think Goldwater's candidacy, the the extremism, as, as many Americans came to see it, of Goldwater accounts for why it was that LBJ won by such an enormous margin? I think that's a huge part of LBJ's victory. Although I would not count LBJ out in mm. any contest against any person, LBJ was so single-minded of purpose and had such strong ambition for a win bigger than Roosevelt's biggest mm. that he would have gone equally hard against a Rockefeller or a Lodge, but we we can't know. Certainly Goldwater's Goldwater's extremism uh, is not uh, not in his favor. Mm -hmm. John Connolly, uh, the governor of Texas and a political protege of Johnson's, told Johnson in February of 1964, I don't see that they got anybody, though, that's appealing to people much. Goldwater has gone crazy. He wants yeah. to go into Cuba with the Marines, and he's just nutty as a fruitcake. Yeah. And in fact... Goldwater had talked about lobbing one, meaning a nuclear bomb, into the men's room of the Kremlin. Right. He had also talked about sawing off 
the east coast of the United States <laughs> and separating it from the country. He had talked about abolishing social security, among other mm -hmm. things. So he did appear to be beyond the pale. And Johnson took advantage of that mm -hmm. in so many ways. Perhaps one of the most important and most well-known aspects of the Johnson campaign is the infamous Daisy commercial that Absolutely. shows the little girl sitting and it's not a daisy, it's a sunflower, uh, but sitting with the flower, picking off the petals uh, as the mushroom cloud explodes behind her. The commercial was only shown once on broadcast television as an advertisement. We like to say that line a lot, but it wasn't the only ad that suggested Goldwater was a nuclear warmonger. Mm -hmm. There was also uh, advertisements that talked about the risk of nuclear material showing up in the milk that children drank. And another ad that suggested a cute little girl eating an ice cream cone was soon to die in nuclear holocaust if Barry Goldwater was elected president. So mm -hmm. the the, the, the politicking on that issue was fast and furious on Johnson's behalf. He also had a group called the Five O'Clock Club uh, that was full of uh, really smart government lawyers and lawyers outside of government, but in Washington, D.C., loyal to Johnson. And they were called the five o'clock club because they met every day at five o'clock. Uh, and what they were doing was uh, following everything that Goldwater said and feeding to the press response lines. So the press was fairly partisan in favor of Johnson. Uh, there was no Fox News, for example, in 1964. And journalists tended to favor Johnson fairly heavily over Goldwater and so the five o'clock club would provide Goldwater's traveling press corps with critical questions to ask and uh, did lots of other things like that to get under Goldwater's skin and make sure the American people were properly educated about the risks of a Goldwater presidency. Right, right. Um, and it seems to have worked, right, given the enormous... Um, uh, landslide. Um, and, and the landslide, of course, um, had to have been tremendously gratifying to LBJ himself, who wanted to win his uh, political battles by by huge margins. He also had very long and impressive coattails in the 64 election. Talk, if you would, for a moment about how Congress changed as a consequence of the 64 race. And of course, this would be really important to what LBJ was able to accomplish during the famous 89th uh, Congress that uh, sat between 1965 and 1967. Yeah, the great 89th, as mm. it was termed. Yeah, so Johnson had margins in the House and the Senate that Democratic and Republican presidents since can only dream about. Uh, these are New Deal, these are early New Deal level margins. Uh, the Democrats picked up 38 new seats in the House of Representatives, giving Democrats a 295 to 140 majority in the House. And the Democrats picked up two new seats in the U.S. Senate mm -hmm. for a 68 to 32 majority. Now, you might be wondering, oh, that's just two seats in the Senate. Why does that matter? Well, think about the complexities of the Democratic Party in 1964. There were multiple Democratic parties. We've already talked about the Republicans as undergoing a civil war. Well, there's the Southern Democrats and there's everyone else. And so even with 66 to 34, if I did the math right while on a Zoom call talking to 330 people, uh, <laughs> that was not safe enough for Johnson's legislative ambitions 
given the conservatism of Southern Democrats and the conservatism that has only intensified in the aftermath of Lyndon Johnson's quote unquote betrayal of the mm-hmm. South by signing civil rights legislation into law, if you will. So these majorities give Johnson a very liberal Congress with which to work that is ready to enact elementary and edu- and secondary education act, higher education act, Medicare, Medicaid, which at the time was really not intended to be a big deal. It was a mm-hmm. housekeeping measure, but it became a big deal after the Voting Rights Act, environmental legislation, consumer protection legislation, legislation for the arts and the humanities, uh, legislation for urban renewal, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Grab your copy of the Vantage Point from your local library and look at the uh, front piece and the back piece, which just lists every bill signed into law during the Johnson presidency and the overwhelming number in that 65 to 67 period. I would argue though that every gift comes with an unintended consequence. And I think one unintended consequence of the great 89th was that Johnson perhaps took his congressional majority a little bit too much for granted. Uh It didn't work hard enough in 66 to retain his strength. Now, the Republicans don't gain control in 66, but the margins narrow considerably, and it's much harder for Johnson to legislate in the second half of his presidency than in the first. Of course, that's exacerbated by Vietnam, which is becoming more deadly and less popular with each new uh, uh, accounting of the dead and uh, the deepening of what appeared to be nothing more than a stalemate. Uh, Mm -hmm. So much so that college kids were outside the White House chanting, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today by the end of Johnson's presidency? So one of the fascinating things to me about talking about elections is that they very readily suggest counterfactuals, what might have happened if something different had played out. Mm -hmm. And I think in connection with the 64 race, the counterfactual is not so much what what would have happened if Barry Goldwater won, because that was pretty far-fetched and the margin was huge. But what if LBJ had defeated a more moderate Republican um, who would have performed better and have uh, perhaps, um, uh, you know, the, the Congress, it's the makeup of Congress might have been somewhat different as well. What would a Johnson presidency have looked like if it had to work harder for the things that it, it most wanted? Maybe more time would have been taken to craft bills. Mm-hmm. I think about some of the war on poverty legislation that once it was passed, It was yesterday's news and there wasn't a lot of attention or care given to making sure that the legislation worked as intended. So perhaps there might have been more care to bring all voices into the drafting of the bills and into the implementation of the legislation. I don't think Johnson would have been any less ambitious. Right. uh, his ambition was as tall as he and uh, uh, as as wide as the Perdinalis after a heavy rain. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, Johnson. Uh, Johnson did not shy from what he wanted to accomplish, but he also would have understood that with narrower margins and maybe more Republicans, a different path would have to have been taken. Mm -hmm. Republicans, though, wouldn't have bothered Johnson that much. Uh, That's the thing about coming out of Texas, a one-party Texas. Well, it's still a one-party Texas. It's just a different party. Uh, uh, But Johnson's 
schooling in one party Texas politics in the teens and the 20s uh, taught him how to work with different factions and didn't fully give him an appreciation of the two party system. So he was good at working across factional lines. And I think that's something that would have helped him in working uh, with, uh, with, with Republicans had they been more potent in Congress in 1965. Yeah, thank you for that. And by the way, let me pause just for a moment to remind our audience that uh, there's an opportunity here to put questions into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And I hope that uh, many of you will do that in the next couple of minutes before I turn things over to the Q&A part of our, of our program. Nancy, I want to wrap up, though, um, by just asking you a couple of very broad questions about the general significance of the 1964 sure. election. And and the first thing I'd, I'd like to ask you about is the the trajectory of American conservatism. Um, so going back a little bit to the Goldwater side of the equation, you know, there's this joke about the 1964 election that Barry Goldwater actually won. It just took 16 years to recognize it, right? With uh, Ronald Reagan's yeah. victory. Yeah. In, in 1980. Is, is that right? Is that how we should think about the 1964 elections? This kind of foretaste, this early taste of where American politics actually would go uh, in the next decade and a half? That's not wrong, mm -hmm. but that's just one story of the legacy of 1964. The, the, the Democrats and liberal Democrats have yet to recover to their 1964 level um, of uh, political potency with Johnson. And liberals never really embraced Johnson either. Uh, Johnson used to tell the joke, how do you tell the difference between a cannibal and a liberal? And uh, he would say, uh, cannibals don't eat their own, uh, implying that the liberals were, yes, uh, uh, and that's some of his insecurity uh, coming into play. Uh, so, but what do I mean by uh, the legacy of liberalism after Johnson? Uh, so I regularly teach the U.S. history survey class that is required of all degree-seeking students in public institutions in this state. And when I'm getting to the end of the semester, I put a picture up on my PowerPoint of the transition period from George W. Bush to Barack Obama. George W. Bush still in the White House, but Barack Obama as president-elect. Uh, George W. Bush invited all of the living former presidents to come to the White House to meet with Obama to essentially school him on being president, not in a negative way, but in a you're in the fraternity now kind of way. And I'm sure that this was the accident of the camera lens and the accident of tie selection that morning. But Jimmy Carter is kind of off by himself and Obama is in the center of the photo with the two presidents, Bush and Clinton the two presidents, Bush and Clinton and Obama, all have on blue ties and Carter has on a red tie in the photo. And again, that's an accident of what tie do you pull off the rack in the morning or what tie perhaps more appropriately did Rosalind and uh, Laura and Barbara and Michelle and I'm not sure Hillary was picking out Bill's ties, but, uh, you know, what ties did wives say go best with this suit. I, I think it's all an accident, but it also shows the the linking together of two of the three Democratic uh, presidents leaving Biden out because Biden's not a thing yet at this point in time as president uh, since, since Johnson. And the point that I try to make to my classes is, is I'll ask them, who was the last liberal president? And depending upon at what point am I teaching? I get either 
Obama or Clinton as an answer. I haven't taught the survey since Biden has been president, so I would probably get Biden if I was teaching it now. Uh, I realize that. But I tell them that's not that's probably not the correct answer. And then I say, uh, summing up all the internal courage I can muster, yeah. that the answer is Richard Nixon. Uh, that would be my answer. <laughs> and uh, and their shock and horror. Mm -hmm. And I explained that it has less to do with Richard Nixon and more to do with the fact that Democrats still controlled mm -hmm. Congress, the House and the Senate, and they passed more legislation that was of a piece with what they had been passing for Johnson in the 60s. Yeah. So in that way, Johnson's legacy continues into the Nixon presidency and policies associated with Johnson, I would argue, have forever remade how we live our lives, right? So would I be sitting here today as a history department chair routinely fielding queries, will I apply for this or that deanship? And the answer is a resounding no, uh, but that's not because I'm not qualified. It's because I don't want to do that job. Uh, would people of color hold the positions that they hold? So much of that goes back to Johnson, the 64 Civil Rights Act, and Title VII within the 64 Civil Rights Act and just how fundamentally 64 civil rights and Title VII and the social movements that come out of that remake America. Maybe Goldwater and the Republicans won presidential politics, but in other ways, the legacy of Johnson's liberalism remains with us. Wonderful um, answer. I, I I think you've captured it so so neatly. It's complicated, right? The yeah. the dominant political mood turns against liberalism, against what Lyndon Johnson worked for and stood for in so many ways. And yet so many of the achievements of Lyndon Johnson's presidency endure and really structure life in 21st century America in profound ways. Nancy Thank you so much for being with me. I have dozens more questions. I wish I had time for me to, to lob at you, but I'm going to turn that privilege over to folks in our wonderful audience this afternoon and um, uh, to my colleague, Sarah McCracken, who will sort through those questions and pose a few more to you. Uh, Nancy, thank you again. Congratulations on Two Sons of the Southwest, Lyndon Johnson, Barry Goldwater, and the 1964 battle between liberalism and conservatism. Re I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Mark. It was great fun. Hello, Nancy. Um, and I'm honored to offer some questions from our audience. Um, the first question is from Cliff. How did Goldwater, the extremist, later become the elder statesman of the GOP? Sure. So, yes, Goldwater was an extremist, but Goldwater was also a politician who understood how politics worked. And when he goes back into the United States Senate, he has several moments that allow him to show his statesmanship. Perhaps the most important one is associated with the downfall of Richard Nixon's presidency. Goldwater was one of several Republicans who went to Nixon and told him, the jig is up. You need to leave. You need to resign and you need to resign now. You're not going to prevail in an impeachment inquiry. Your president will, or your presidency will end in an inglorious way if you fight to hang on and you need to go. And so Goldwater's taking of that stance is really important to showing him as a statesman in his elder years. I think in other ways, Goldwater looks statesmanlike today by virtue of what was and was not a part of Goldwater's conservatism, right? So I talked about 
liberalism moving into rights-based issues in the 1960s. While Goldwater opposed the 1964 Civil Rights Act, it was not because he opposed equality for African Americans. He just opposed that particular methodology for achieving it. Goldwater was a member of civil rights organizations like the NAACP and others. He just didn't like the federal government's role in it. He preferred a different strategy. Goldwater was also a strong supporter of women's bodily autonomy, read as abortion rights and the like. So Goldwater would not be a perfect fit or a fit at all in today's Republican Party, uh, given, uh, given the difference in the strong difference in some of his positions and those of today's GOP. Uh, the willingness to stand up to the sitting president is, uh, is, is pretty significant and the unwillingness to jump on, jump fully on the train of uh, campaigning against uh, campaigning, against personal choice, personal identity, that sort of thing, uh, would not would not situate himself well in today's Republican Party. He would probably, if Goldwater were around today, he would probably be more in line with, say, a Lisa Murkowski or a Susan Collins than uh, the dominant uh, dominant voices in the GOP. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, Betty asks, what is the lesson for the upcoming presidential election comparing it to the 64 election, in your opinion, seeing the great divide we have currently in the U.S.? Okay, you asked. So I'll I'll, I'll give it to you uh, in uh, a way uh, that Lyndon Johnson would have appreciated with the bark off. Uh, meaning the 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 my 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 truth and my whole truth, and I could be wrong. Don't elect a deranged and delusional demagogue, especially when you've had experience with that deranged and delusional demagogue, and do elect a Congress that will give a majority leader Chuck Schumer and a speaker Hakeem Jeffries the numbers they need to enact the policies of the Democratic president who would be elected, which would be Joe Biden because he's the only Democrat running, uh, like him, uh, have lukewarm feelings toward him or whatever. Uh, it works better if there is, uh, uh, if, if Congress and the presidency can speak with the same voice and get something done. Um, thank you. This question is from Jim. He asks, was Goldwater really as crazy in his approach to governing as he was, as he was portrayed uh, by the Democrats and much of the media? So Goldwater was a shoot from the hip kind of guy. And he did talk about the indiscriminate use of nuclear weapons. He did talk about eliminating Social Security while campaigning for the votes of senior citizens. He did talk about things that would would have seemed and did seem nutty to Americans at the time. One of Goldwater's slogans was, in your heart, you know he's right, playing on that right as conservative and right as correct, uh, the two different meanings of the word right. Democratic wags added a line to the in your heart, you know he's right line with in your guts, you know he's nuts. And so was he as crazy as the Democrats said? No, probably not. Um, he was a normal politician, but he did hold extreme views. There was not a consensus about getting rid of Social Security. There was not a consensus that nuclear war with the Soviet Union was a good idea, which would be the result of lobbing one into the men's room of the Kremlin. Uh, so 
he did have some some ideas that were were far to the right and that's how come he was painted as such but he was still a normal politician who understood negotiation and give and take and and all such as that thank you um you talked about governor rockefeller uh, who were some of the other moderate Republicans who sought the nomination in 64 and why did they fall short? Sure. Uh, probably the other most prominent uh, Republican and seeking is the wrong word here. Probably the other most prominent Republican who garnered sufficient votes to be a contender was Henry Cabot Lodge II. But he was not in any way that we would understand it seeking the nomination. He had an ambassador, an appointment as an ambassador. And so he was doing his ambassadorial work. He was never out on the hustings. He didn't seek to raise money. He didn't go give speeches at rubber chicken dinners. He didn't do any of that sort of stuff that we associate with politicking. But nevertheless, people voted for him because they saw him as a standard bearer of the Eastern moderate establishment. And uh, they had liked what he had said uh, when he had been Nixon's uh, vice presidential candidate in, in 60. So he, he had a following in that regard. Um, and then how was, where was George Wallace in the, in the 64 race and what role did he play? Yeah. Uh, so George Wallace makes an, a, a aborted attempt to challenge Johnson. That doesn't go anywhere. Uh, at one point, George Wallace actually sent in the run up to the Republican, uh, uh, convention, George Wallace sent an emissary to the Goldwater team to suggest that Goldwater select Wallace as his running mate uh, for the presidency. Goldwater was nonplussed. Uh, it's like, he's a Democrat. Why would I do that? Uh, so that's that's George Wallace in uh, 1964. That and his uh, third party uh, run that uh, gains him uh, gains him votes in 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 the South, but he's he's a non-factor uh, in 1964. Uh, we'll see more of Wallace, in, and Wallace will be more of a factor once we get to 1968. Uh, Another question from our audience. How do you explain the vice presidential choices of the two candidates? Sure. So let me uh, talk about uh, William Miller first. Goldwater wanted someone that he thought would get under LBJ's skin. So that's why he chose Miller, so that Miller could be an attack dog on, on the Johnson team. Uh, Johnson and Humphrey uh, were were close in the Senate. Uh, Johnson had mentored Humphrey ever since Humphrey's election to the Senate in uh, the 1940s. Uh, Johnson uh, saw Humphrey as a liberal who, with whom he could work, uh, a liberal with pragmatism. And so Johnson had, had been grooming Humphrey for uh, rising politically for uh, for some time, and uh, even though Johnson could make Humphrey's life a living nightmare, uh, think about the drawn out process by which Johnson finally decides on Humphrey as his VP pick. All of this is happening quietly and behind the scenes. Johnson's not doing this publicly to publicly embarrass Humphrey. He's just doing it to maximize his, his role as the president on, on the ticket. So he chose Humphrey because he had genuine respect for Humphrey. 
even though there were more than a few occasions and more than a few examples of Johnson talking down to Humphrey. But these were things that were well known to Hubert Humphrey before he said yes to Lyndon Johnson and things that were part of their partnership, if you will. Sandy asks, for having been trounced, the Republicans seem to leave 1964 with some strength. The South begins to vote always with the Republicans. There's new strength in the Southwest and the border states. The conservative position on many issues is solidified. Do you think this race was in some ways a help to conservatives in the future? Definitely, definitely. So there's the conversation that Lyndon Johnson and Jake Pickle, uh, who represented uh, represented Austin in Congress for so many years, had after the House of Representatives passed the 1964 Civil Rights Act, Johnson made a point of calling those few members of Congress who uh, cast very difficult votes. Now, in 2024, or even uh, in the Austin of the 80s and the 90s, when I was a student there, it's hard to imagine why voting for civil rights would have been difficult with the Austin electorate of the late 20th or the early 21st century. But the Austin electorate of 1964 wasn't what Austin is now. And Pickle was very afraid that by voting for 64 civil rights, he was signing his political uh, death certificate. So he uh, went out and got drunk, really, really, really drunk after casting that vote. And Lyndon Johnson had been calling the hotel where Pickle had an apartment all night to talk to Pickle to thank him for his vote. And when Pickle finally made his way in, the desk clerk receptionist said, Congressman Pickle, the White House has been calling. You need to call Lyndon Johnson. Pickle said he's the last person on earth I want to talk to right now. And the person at the desk uh, said, I I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Pickle, but I can't lie to the White House. He's going to call again. <laughs> And I'm going to put the call through. So you better talk to him yourself. So Pickle and Johnson talked and they agreed that the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act would give the South to the Republican Party for a generation. They were right and they were wrong. It did give the South to the Republican Party, but we're several generations in by now with few signs of uh, that letting up with the exception of maybe the two Democratic senators from Georgia and uh, the like. Uh, the South seems still to be solidly Republican. Uh, so yes, in that way, uh, the Goldwater candidacy does help shape the future direction of the Republican Party. Thank you. Um, this will be our last question. Uh, what did you find most interesting or what new information did you discover as you prepared to write this book? Oh, that is a good question. And all right, I know which direction I'll go. One thing that I had wanted to talk about, but we just didn't have time. So this is my opportunity. The role of Lady Bird Johnson in all of this. Lady Bird Johnson does something in 1964 that had never been done before by a first lady. And that is she went out on the political hustings by herself to campaign for her husband as president. She does this in a variety of settings, but most importantly, on the whistle stop tour that she takes departing from Alexandria, Virginia, and arriving several days later in New Orleans, Louisiana. And this is all part of the Johnson's sense that as president, Johnson is president, not just of those Americans that voted for him, but president of every American. 
And as somebody seeking to hold the presidency, it's important to ask for the vote of every American, not just those who are going to vote for you anyway. So that meant campaigning in the South and campaigning in the Deep South. That was not something that would have been terribly wise for Lyndon Johnson to do in the immediate aftermath of signing the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And Lady Bird made the case that she was the better Johnson to make that trip. And so she dons her own... Uh, uh, she, she she goes into the South with her own Southerness on full display. Whereas Johnson had his uh, Johnson treatment, I would argue that there was a ladybird treatment as well. And it was on full display on this whistle stop tour. She held court in her own train car with Southern governors and Southern mayors and Southern lawmakers trying to win them over to supporting the ticket. They knew that not every state in the South was going to vote for Johnson. Mississippi was a lost cause. I, I, you know, that's just obvious. But there is also coming into view on the whistle stop Another change that happens in Southern politics, and it would be wrong for us to look at the changes in Southern politics to just be about the rise of the Republican Party. We need to also consider the rise of the Black Democrat in the South and the role of Black Southern Democrats, maybe not as Southern governors, but as mayors of Southern cities and as uh, holders of congressional seats from the South. None of this would have been possible without Civil Rights 64 or Voting Rights 65. And you see some of that in the Lady Bird special. She speaks to mixed race audiences all along the way. There are African Americans who are train side greeters when her train pulls into town because of the importance of what she's what what she and her husband have done. You also see the vitriol against the Johnsons for civil rights coming out in some of the signage critical of Lady Bird. At one stop, there was a sign held up, and I quote, Blackbird, go home. And that is layered with all kinds of racial, uh, racial and racist uh, meanings and criticisms of 64 civil rights. Top that off with the speech that Lyndon Johnson gave half prepared, half extemporaneous in New Orleans when he flew down to greet Lady Bird at the end of the whistle stop. So the first half of his speech was his standard campaign stem speech. Speaking to a mixed race audience in New Orleans, Louisiana, in the fall of 1964, Johnson then begins to tell stories that he grew up on of how the race card had been used to keep poor whites and poor blacks disenfranchised throughout the 20th century and gives, gives a speech that I wish I could quote from but the language is cringeworthy now in 2024. It was revolutionary in 1964 because of the way he turned racism and the use of the N-word on its head to make a political point about the continued importance of economic liberalism to lift up poor blacks and poor whites in a region of the country that remained left behind. Well, thank you. This was a really interesting conversation, and I'm going to turn it over to Phil Barnes to wrap us up. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nancy Young and Mark Lawrence and Sarah McCracken for another really special afternoon. That was a terrific conversation. And we will be back next Thursday, February the 8th at 4 p.m.
for a conversation with none other than Carl Rove, perhaps best known as one of the nation's premier political consultants and advisors to many Republican candidates, including most notably President George W. Bush. Carl Rove is also an accomplished writer. He has a weekly op-ed column in the Wall Street Journal, as well as the author of The Triumph of William McKinley, Why the Election of 1896 Still Matters. We hope to see you next time. Thank you and goodbye.